You're live. Good morning and welcome uh, to Tigers United webinar series, The Road to Vladivostok. Uh, if you're joining us more globally, good afternoon or good evening to you. I am Dr. Brett Wright, Director of Tigers United University Consortium, a collaborative partnership among Auburn, Clemson, LSU, and the University of Missouri, all united in our cause to support the Global Tiger Recovery Program. I'm very pleased to welcome you today and to introduce our noted speaker, Dr. Ashesh Gopal, currently the Secretary General of the Global Tiger Forum. Dr. Gopal is one of the world's leading experts on tigers and their prey, having worked in the field for almost 35 years. As a former member of the Indian Forest Service, he served as director of several tiger-rich reserves in India, including Kana and Bangnavar. As director, he implemented several innovative programs, one of which saved the Barasinga, the endangered central Indian swamp deer. Dr. Gopal coordinated Project Tiger, the Indian national program to save wild tigers for almost 15 years and helped establish the National Tiger Conservation Authority of which he served as leader also for several years. Dr. Gopal has been instrumental in standardizing tiger monitoring protocols, special initiative for prey and tiger translocation, strengthening protection and patrolling and implementing India's eco development project, which enhanced management uh, planning and practices across all protected areas. As secretary general, of the Global Tiger Forum, Dr. Gopal is actively engaged with people in the 13 Tiger Range countries and partners with them to strengthen tiger conservation efforts globally. So it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce you today, my dear friend, Dr. Rashesh Gopal. Rashesh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brett. Thank you. And uh, I must uh, thank the Tigers United University Consortium um, for giving me this chance. And good morning to you all. Uh, mm, I prefer to make this a bit interactive. So I'll, there are a lot of things to speak, you know, uh, so much to say about tigers, the wild tigers. Uh, but uh, I'll try to retain the focus so that I can uh, highlight the what is the status prevailing in the tiger range countries what needs to be done what works what doesn't what the consortium and the gtf and like-minded partners can uh, do the possible options which are before them uh, and as far as the revival goes what best can be thought of. So um, I have a structured presentation, but I'll uh, I'll stick to that. But uh, in between, I'll say something. You know, I'll deviate from that as well. But I'll try to uh, finish it in say, on a, I mean, say uh, 25 minutes, 26 minutes, and the rest of the time for interaction and questions and all the let's see. So um, uh, the uh, next slide, Munish. Uh, should I change this slide? Or? Uh, the global status uh, of wild tigers uh, now is less than 4,000. We say it's 4,000, but uh, since several uh, range countries, tiger range countries have not come out with the official estimation, we have, uh, along with WWF, we have uh, made a compilation and um, it's a little less than 4,000. Um, and another fact, um, the 14 to two, that is doubling the tiger numbers uh, is some of the tiger range countries, three of them in Southeast Asia have serious problems uh, and there are local extinctions. Now, let me say, before I proceed further, what is T into two? So there was uh, uh, the, uh, the World Bank and Keshav uh, is with us, perhaps in the, uh, listening to whatever we are articulating 
and of course brett all others consortium people know about this the world bank launched uh, the global tiger initiative um, and then in 2010 at st petersburg uh, prior to that lot many things happened and the, the, the range countries committed to double their tiger numbers so that is what we call as t into two i am not repeating those things because kesha might have touched upon those aspects in his presentation earlier so the doubling the tiger number is a commitment uh, made by tiger range countries uh, so that's a, that's a, a, a very welcome thing because it's a sovereign issue and countries need to own this and commit for doubling the numbers if the goal is like that then certainly the lot of lot of things are called for and the commitment is well appreciated much needed uh, now coming back to the status um lao pdr vietnam cambodia there are serious problems uh, getting into nearing local extinction rather i mean you don't see them now so um, the situation in uh, malaysia malaysia is very keen to revive uh, bring back the original status of the malayan tigers but there are issues uh, the character the contours of the natural forests are changing rapidly because of uh, uh, because of um, palm oil plantations other monocultures dictated by market forces so many things are there but we could appreciate the gtf mission um uh, was there several times and uh, we appreciate their commitment right from the top to uh, do their best for strengthening the wild tigers in their country and uh, they they will be hosting the forthcoming ministerial which is a precursor to the t into 2 meet at vladivostok so there are several several causes so much to say why tigers uh continue to remain in danger um uh, there are uh, so many of us are aware and pardon me for repeating it but the obvious ones uh, i need to highlight again uh we are uh, witnessing uh, tremendous transformations in the landscapes now this change um uh, is driven by a lot of uh, positive factors we are in an age uh, anthropocene age the age of the man where we, we have the capability um the strength to change the uh, distort the ecosystem in fact many people have um, uh have coined a special term also you know the uh i mean i don't remember it exactly but uh, uh, we have the outcome is lot of anthropogenic habitats are all around and uh, tigers if we uh, if we don't uh, provide them the uh, natal area where they can uh, complete their life dynamics life cycle uh, requirements then uh, they may not breed they will not breed so uh, uh, can we have the earlier slide let me complete that a few things were left so just quickly touching upon poaching we know it's a serious issue trafficking demand then the farming issue is there and, and apart from the targeted killings like poaching the habitat is another serious thing and then the uh, need for more investments by countries the sovereign countries uh and to and also to come out with a dispassionate uh, uh assessment of the habitat the prey the core predator status and the tiger status it becomes very important and, uh, and and there are lot many things which are required on this front the next slide um now just yes, this is of uh, i mean we know that the uh, taxonomists uh, with the Um, molecular biology and the new tools in place uh, and they revise uh, for at this juncture for management purposes uh, it would suffice i feel that there were eight subspecies 
the Panthera tigris, tigris is the nominate species. And uh, out of the eight, three are gone. The Caspian, Javan, Bali tigers are no more. That leaves uh, five spe subspecies. Subsequently, another classification was put forth uh, based on molecular characterization. Uh, they said there are six subspecies. Tra su subsequent to that as well, um, in 2015, uh, Wilting et al. said that there are only two subspecies, the Sunda tigers, uh, the ti tiger, and the continental panthera tigris tigris. So anyway, uh, uh, if it is uh, typical to a country, the country derives some pride, a sovereign pride in protecting and doing more for the tigers. So we leave it at that and we prefer to stick to the old uh, um, categorization, classification of eight subspecies. The next, um, uh, this shows the distribution. Uh, we brought it out earlier, sometime back, uh, uh, when they, when there was a meet, uh, um, um, the GTI uh, meeting was there in, in Dhaka uh, in 2014. Uh, this tiger atlas shows the past distribution, the historical distribution, which you see the grayish shaded areas and the um, uh, forest cover distribution during the 18th century, which is shown with the yellow cover and the green ones are the ones where you see them now. You can appreciate the shrinkage of the um, distribution. In the past, it used to be in a vast, and the spread was very vast, but now it has shrunk. The next slide. Now, let me say something very briefly uh, about uh, uh, the evolution. Of course, it, you can say so many things about this, but putting bits and pieces together, uh, over 11 million years ago, it is stated that uh, the living cat species trace their origin to a panther-like creature in Southeast Asia, known as the period is known as geologically late Miocene period. And a uh, little later, say, 10.8 years or 10 million years ago, there, there was a divergence in this group and the panthera lineage, that is the tiger lineage, tigers and other cats, you know, they separated out. The one group, it was larger in size, uh, the roaring cats, the big cats. And the other one, smaller in size, like the cloud, clouded leper, which, which, we, which we call as the purring cats. Now, there was a divergence. And um, in Asia, where you have these big cats, the tiger in particular, uh, between 1.8 million and 11,000 years ago, um, they evolved. That is the Pleistocene uh, period. And the fossils are, earliest fossils are, have been found in Northern China, Java, and so on. So, uh, Finally, uh, Southeast Asia becomes very important. Now, this is the place where they evolved, spread everywhere, the sort of a cradle. Now, uh, this is also an, uh, uh, that portion of a globe, part of the globe, of the planet, where you are seeing tremendous transformations. So you need a lot of uh, uh, special efforts to uh, revive and restore the tiger populations by addressing issues which uh, cause decimation of the welfare factors, including their habitat. So next one. Now, a little bit about the tigers. There are so many things to say, but the time constraint is there. I'll not uh, touch upon those things. All that I would like to say, it's a cat species, a jet gestation, the pregnancy period is very short, like any other cat or domestic cat, 90 to 100 days. Um, then um, uh, it breeds throughout the year. And uh, as a thumb rule, three in a litter, sometimes four. And for some uh, several parts of Central India, uh, more than four have also, also been uh, seen. 
but then the neonatal mortality is 50 percent. Uh, if there are four, only two may survive soon after birth. So the weaklings get eliminated. Sometimes even the mother eats them away. Then there are uh, a lot of demographic data to show what is the sur survival percentage when they reach a year, one year age, of one, when they become one year old, and then one to two year, two to three year, uh, and so on and so forth. But you can say roughly 50% chances are there till they get recruited and uh, till they establish themselves as adults. Till then, it's all tentative for them. Then uh, they, there is a dynamics which operates. They are territorial animals. There are a lot of adaptations in tigers. Like any other cats, there are 18 or 19 adaptations, right from the body structure, the endoskeleton, the dental formula, the uh, vertebral formula, the ligaments, the knuckle ligaments. It's like a living machine uh, created by nature to successfully predate and thrive. So the olfaction, the smell, the audition, the night vision, what we can't see, they can see, and the stealth and um, the way they uh, can perceive and the uh, scent glands, sebaceous glands, the padded paws. There are so many adaptations and the way they stalk. But uh, these adaptations help the species initially. But later, uh, uh, the, looking at the way they, uh, they, they have shrunk, their spaces have shrunk, and they have been targeted. We may, uh, we may start thinking that they are acting to sort of a disadvantage for the species um, because they get targeted soon. For example, say uh, the males take some kind of a big tra long traverse from the source area, the natal area where they, where they are born. The idea, the nature has set this kind of a ontogenic um, programming so that the there is uh, the uh, mating between siblings is naturally avoided. But if there are no options, if the if there is a domination of landscapes which varied land uses, which is usually the case, then they may be compelled to um, do the courtship with whatever is available. The siblings may mate, and you may have surfacing of recessive alleles. There are a lot of things to speak on that. Now, um, coming back to the presentation, um, there is a source area where they breed, uh, uh, provided the conditions are favorable. That is, you need a lot of forests. You need forests because the forests need, are required for uh, sustaining a good prey base and the natural prey on which uh, these big cats, like the tiger, they survive. Uh, just to uh, highlight, an encumbered uh, tigress, that is a tigress with uh, trailing cubs, may be required to make three kills in a week. Each kill may, may be of 50 kilos weight on an average, minus the antlers or horns and the hooves and other things. If you remove those portions, the flesh, the solid meat needs to be around 45 to 50 kilo. You can imagine what kind of a biomass is required for a viable population. Uh, so uh, more on the uh, source population in the next few slides, but you need to have a, a source population and you need to have a sink population. What is a source population? Source population, I mean, where the births exceed the deaths. At this juncture, let's, let's uh, uh, understand this. Some of you may know it more. Uh, the births should be more so that there, there, are, there is a reproductive surplus. What is a sink population? Sink population is something outside in the peripheral areas, uh, which needs to uh, be there. And for it to be there, it needs to have a connection with the source population. And uh, so sink, sink population is a population where deaths may exceed births. That's, that is, you need to have a connectivity. That is why we insist on um, 
corridor linkages. These sinks need to be linked. Hubs and sinks, the uh, basic thing in landscape. Um, and that becomes very relevant and important at this juncture to manage wild tigers. And these linkages need to be sort of um, intact so that there is genetic flow, movement of tigers is possible. And for that to be made possible, you need to address issues like the dependency of people, the other stakeholders, there are so many stakeholders uh, who have varied demands on the landscape, including the linkages. So you need to address all those things. And this varies from tiger range country to tiger range country. So you need a, um, you have, you need, you need to have a portfolio. Uh, and then within the portfolio, the overarching portfolio, uh, you need to have uh, country specific um, portfolios. So that there comes the differentiated approach. Um, in the next slide, and this I have stated, but I'll just be very brief. Uh, uh, a viable population uh, is something like 20 breeding tigresses, not tiger, tigresses. The sex ratio is skewing towards females. That is for every two females, there should be one male. And need, there may, I mean, the, it ord, it's ordained by nature. It's more females, less of males. But in some countries at this juncture, say for example, in some source areas in Malaysia, it's the other way around. The camera traps, have recorded, of course, it's not an updated data. When we went there, we saw it two years back. You have uh, more of uh, males and less of females. Now, there's a problem there. If you, have, if you have more males and less of females, so there will be competition for mating. And the, the female has to come into eaters, easters again, to be ready for courtship and mating. That will happen only if the litter is lost. So there'll be more mortality. Issues like that, you know, the population will never grow. And it means there is a, going to be a dip and diminishing local extinction is in the offing. So issues are like that. So a 20 breeding tigresses, uh, given that kind of a sex ratio, 10, eight to 10 males, and then say out of 20, um, only 10 participate in, in, in a, during a year in the uh, courtship and, and the successfully breed. And out of those 10, say, out of each in a litter has three, but let's take, for example, only one survive, uh, and the others are encumbered with one one tiger cubs, and there are uh, sub adults uh, waiting in the wings, and there are the old ones which are aged out waiting in the periphery. So, something like 65 to 70 tigers, wild tigers are around. So, if there is a uh, this is what we call as a viable population, which requires an area of 800 to 1200 square kilometer. This has been this has been proved empirically based on real time data um, as collected by the Wildlife Institute of India and the Tiger Authority from various tiger reserves based on radio telemetry studies and other things. So this is what it is. The next slide. Mm -hmm. This I have stated. You have those. That's the source area which we call as the core, uh, where uh, investment is made to uh, the tiger agenda. That is, the focus is only on the tiger. We make available the forest, the water, the the fire protection, other protection, frontline staff in place, and uh, all kinds of uh, technology, possible technology and um, uh, protocols to monitor and uh, put everything in place so that you start generating a reproductive surplus. And the surrounding area, uh, it's a co-occurrence area where you, you have, it's more challenging. The agenda is very aggressive that you need to, uh, mind you, uh, there is no coexistence. In many books, many papers, many people say about coexistence. I cannot, I just can't digest this. There can't be any, one can't say this. There can never be any coexistence between uh, a big cat and a human being. It's co-occurrence. And co-occurrence comes with a lot of trade-offs at a great cost. So you need to compromise a lot. So you, while ma managing the uh, peripheral area, you need to save such patches so that the sink populations are 
taken care of and they have a chance to move around to a next bigger um, uh, um, source area. But also at the same time, you have to manage the interface. This interface, largely in countries like India or Malaysia or even in Russia, everywhere it is the human uh, tiger interface. Now the, uh, the landscape is open, it's an open treasury, you can't put, lock it. So there are a lot of demands. And then, then of course the development agenda, so many things are there. The productivity of those areas is different than what you see in the source areas where the focus is only tiger and tiger alone. So there you can't afford to step up the uh, step of your uh, increased actions for boosting tiger numbers. If you do that, it will be counterproductive because you'll enter, you'll usher in more interface issues. So you need to arrest it at some stage so that it just serves as a buffer, as a porous poor, poor area where they get a chance. These pulsating source areas, sending out the surplus and the successful ones and the uh, move around through these porous uh, available patches and try successfully move on to another source area that intermingling becomes possible. There are, there are instances in the Indian context, tiger from central India uh, moving to somewhere in South India, so on and so forth. So uh, let me let me have a few more slides. I'll try to compress this. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Mm, um, now let's go to the next slide. I think we have covered this next one. I uh, sort of we have covered this as well. Next one. Now, uh, this becomes important. Uh, so I need to say something on this. Uh, since you need to address the source area, you need to address the area beyond. So you need to be centrifugal. Your approach needs to be centrifugal. You can't uh, have a uh, action portfolio which is centripetal in nature. Long time back, uh, there used to be um, uh, policy and decisions of focusing on certain areas alone and saving them, safeguarding them, fencing them. Even now you have fences in some parts, some, uh, some countries and all. Well, however big they may be, you can't do that in the context of uh, such uh, animals which have a source, definite source and sync dynamics. So they need to, you need to provide for address concerns uh, which are uh, may not be, you may not have the direct mandate to address them, but you need to engage with agencies, collaborate with them, uh, including the common citizen and other stakeholders. Stakeholders could be your government departments other than the wildlife department, the regular forest department, the highway department, the department which does the irrigation, looks after the dams and all that, the department which does the rail railway lines and all that, the department um, which looks after the local people welfare, so many things are done, job opportunities are provided. Then of course the business groups and the varied business groups who, who, who take some land, get them diverted and invest in them and produce something. You have the special economic zones and then the uh, so many things linked with that, the pollution, the garbage, the other things, you know all that. So all these things transform the landscape. So now you have two sets of, uh, two categories of, uh, uh, there are so many, but broadly at this juncture, we can say, uh, uh, there are two, two uh, uh, I mean, reasons. One is the, uh, one set is the natural causes like earthquake or the tsunami or, um, or something happening, you know, the uh, accretion or inundation of violence, like what happens in Sundarbans Tiger Reserve, so many things, you know, inundation, fires, this, that natural ones, over which you have no control. The environmental stochasticity is something which, on which no one can have any control. But then, more than the, in this, in the developing countries, including India, the Southeast Asia, South Asia, all these countries, which I stated earlier, the cradle sort of thing where you have the bulk of these wild tigers. The anthropogenic causes are more prevailing, more important. Uh, and the transformation is 
tremendous. See, in the past, if you read Odom's book uh, in ecology, the understanding was, well, that there is a disturbance and the disturbance, the ecosystem tries to revert back to its equilibrium. Well, in the present context, it's not so. Disturbance ecology becomes something very challenging because the equilibrium never, uh, there is no, the nature never gets a chance to revert back to the original state of equilibrium. What you see in these areas is there are altered states. Some, some portions of landscape altered tremendously because of urbanization, because of some things, development, this, that, that's also an equally important agenda. Then there are portions of the landscape, parcels of land where the alteration is 50-50. I mean, uh, semi-forested, partly colonized, agriculture is in progress, it's so many things. And then the third category is where the government has declared certain areas as national parks or uh, um, biosphere reserves or sanctuaries where the investment and the focus is to protect this. So you have these alterations. Now, you can't uh, save something with a dynamics uh, like this. Uh, what you what I stated about the tiger in the context of the tiger by looking at the protected area or the source area alone. You need to have uh, synergies. And you need to have a portfolio which can sync, uh, bring in harmony, mutually complementary actions between these varied agencies, between these varied altered states, so that the positives are retarded and kept at a level so that they don't do more damage. This is exactly what we understand as the landscape approach. And it's very important for South Asia, Southeast Asia, Russia, all these countries where you have Russia on the landscape uh, and there are a lot of stakeholders, a lot of varied ownership is there. It's heterogeneous in nature and uh, the character of the forests have changed because somewhere it is, uh, it is oil plantation, somewhere it is rubber plantation, somewhere there is a fuel plantation, the original character is lost. So all these things are important. So landscape approach is something for the next 15 to 20 years is going to remain there. And it becomes even more important because uh, in the other context as well, because tiger, we, we are not seeing tiger is some kind of a charismatic thing to be saved and just because uh, it needs to be saved. That's also important, uh, intrinsic right of the animal to get saved and all that. But more, more than that, and um, equally important is the, it's an indicator um, for the well-being of the ecosystem services. There are 32 or 33 of them, uh, as Keshav always says. Um, uh, it's uh, snow leopard is the indicator of uh, the well-being of the glacial glaciers all around. Likewise, the tiger, if it's in place, if, if it is viably uh, surviving, thriving in an area, it's looking after, you can uh, rest assured that the ecosystem services are uh, okay. Then apart from that, the other important thing is the, um, is the uh, carbon, new carbon getting locked up, the sequestration. It's a tremendous, adaptation to climate change ill effects. Tiger investment, tiger bearing forests, lock up carbon. Not, by not hacking them, you are ensuring that they get, remain locked up. So you're contributing towards the adaptation, which go unnoticed. So this is a big thing and the, any tiger agenda needs to uh, get prioritized for um, getting funding from the climate kitty. Anyway, that's a different point. And the third one, which, uh, the, uh, which has shaken us very rudely globally everywhere, is the pandemic prevailing everywhere, spreading across, cutting across nations. Now, the kind of, uh, we haven't understood this yet, though there are books and papers and so much has been written about the landscape epidemiology, the dilution effect of forest, uh, the, how the zoonotic cycles uh, are uh, kept in, there is a balance which is uh, fostered by the 
intactness of these forests. And by investing in tiger for bearing forests, by investing, ensuring the sustainability of tiger means you are ensuring uh, some big patches of forests and thereby you are uh, not distorting these zoonotic cycles and pushing them towards an uh, urban scape so that it assumes that an epidemic form and the um, thing becomes out of control. So uh, this pandemic prevention uh, thing is also important in the context of tiger. Tigers do great service, not just a charismatic animal to be photographed by somebody, but it, it's doing so much to the society. So the tiger investment is much needed, uh, likewise the snow leopard investment as well. Uh, then a few more. I mean, I'll just wind up. I will we'll go to see this is this, this particular slide, uh, 14 to 2, and just a, a few moments on this. If you lose everything, say, uh, let's let's focus on the base of the pyramid. If you have um, the habitat, you have the prey, you have the tiger, but maybe less in number, the, uh, the efforts required may be less, the investment may be less. You can still pull it back, you know, there are not many much alterations and all that you can uh, secure it and the landscape beyond and so on and so forth. But go to the top, if you have nothing and the habitat is also not there, it's gone. Then the kind of uh, revival effort, which is called for is tremendous. The, there'll be increasing cost, as you see on your left, and there'll be, uh, it won't be an easy task as the arrow says on the right side. You have to put in a lot of effort. So this situation uh, is everywhere in all the TRCs. You'll come across permutations and combinations of such situations. Not everywhere, every tiger reserve is in a very happy state. Somewhere you'll find this condition uh, prevailing. So that was very, that is very important. Next one. Uh, let's go to let's go to the uh, I'll sum up this in 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 a uh, few words. India has a long track record and a successful one. Some nine reserves. Uh, I'm saying something about India because it's covering more than seventy percent of the wild tigers, global wild tiger population. Started with nine reserves on the first of April, nineteen seventy three. Uh, it was launched as Project Tiger. Today it is. 51 tiger reserve, little more than 2.3% of the country's geographical area. And there is a legislation um, and a special uh, chapter was provided in that, uh, the Wildlife Protection Act of, of uh, uh, India adopted by the tiger states. 18 of them we have in our federal polity, federal structure. And we, uh, in this, um, uh, we, we, have a, we have a lot of normatives. Uh, you need to have a tiger plan, a conservation plan. You need to have uh, provide for the source area, what I spoke about earlier. You need to have a planning for the buffer area, the peripheral area. You need to focus on the corridor linkages, certain do's and don'ts are there. Then there are uh, enabling provisions where the uh, head of the state, that is the chief minister, needs to chair a committee, which is known as a steering committee. Unless the ownership of the uh, guy who's looking after the state is and not there, is there, you can't do this. No, all this happened because the, there was a need. Um, it was felt that the systems of governance needs to be reinvigorated. A tiger task force was created um, by the prime minister who chairs the National Board for Wildlife, which is the uh, highest advisory body to the government of India. So uh, this task force uh, recommended a lot of recommendations and that was implemented, they were the National Tiger Conservation Authority and the Wildlife Crime Control Bureaus, they were set in place and the results are uh, there to see. So uh, you have, um, and the population has revived and India has already uh, got, in, I mean, uh, gone beyond the T into two. So um, that was it. There are so many other things to say, but then I need to give time for questions also. So one good thing also, which is happening here is around 2.5 million mandates are generated annually. You know, unless the common man gets uh, some gains, the portfolio needs to be gainful. You can't, can't be just tigers and tigers only. If you want the um, co-occurrence agenda to be successful, everyone should gain from that. If it's a business group, the business group uh, should gain. It's a quid pro quo. Mutually uh, gainful portfolios are 
required not just the tiger the other guy also should gain from it so this understanding factoring in the concerns of tiger and the tiger filters you are putting in place and they they also gaining something out of it whether it is um, uh, whether it is uh, csr the social environmental responsibility whatever it is there are so many of them uh, but here what these 2.5 million mandates uh, re uh, relate to the common guy who, the uh, villager who lives in and around these tiger areas in india and uh, he faces the interface problem so they have they are provided wages on a day to day basis every month they get paid they are on the payrolls not the permanent job sort of a thing but they are deployed the local workforce they are the real guardians the backbone because they gain from these areas they are safe they are intact and this is the biggest payment for ecosystem services the ecosystem services as i said the adaptation uh, to climate change the ecosystem services the dilution effect vis-a-vis -vis the pandemics all these things are there so the ecosystem the integrity of the ecosystem is safeguarded and these guys are doing the stewardship in return they are getting paid so i i need to stop here there are lot many things to say uh, uh, munish we can kindly rush through these slides in 2 minutes uh, these are some of the publications uh, the national tiger conservation authority uh, does the normatives monitors them and then provides financial support the uh, the forum uh, the global tiger forum a few words about that it is a very old intergovernmental uh, in 1993 it came into existence um, um, the uh, range countries uh, they met there was a conclave here in at new delhi and then they all decided delhi declaration and then the it was a platform uh, of um, owned and manned by tiger range countries and then there of course other collaborators joined and uh, Uh, focused on capacity building and the portfolio was a modest one initially um, subsequently it started uh, enlarging the canvas became big and uh, with cash of support uh, the global tiger initiative council it became uh, being in put coming into place after the phasing out of the initiative by the bank then the, you have this working as an implementing arm on the tiger relating to the tiger agenda you have the snow leopard secretariat and at this uh, at uh, currently uh, if we go back to the earlier slide monish uh, there are few things uh, like um, along with wwf is one such partner where the um, uh, uh, cats conservation assured tiger standards is being implemented the global tiger recovery program the pr preparation of the ntrp plans for tiger range countries and like for myanmar for timanti we worked out a plan we went the mission went there we all sat there discussed with them something like that i you say and we are collaborating and so many are us um usa and then of course the consortium and a uh, lot of uh, uh, collaborators are there wwf so many are there i might have missed out a few but uh, there are many so the 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 the, the one um uh, let's go to the possible options which are uh, there uh, for consortium and the tiger forum to um work together more uh, now this i said you know these are the things you know munish has put them meticulously all those collaborators you see the icons are there including the wildlife institute of india the india's uh, tiger authority usa and the uh, tigers united consortium and all these key partners are there and you have the council keshav's council is the ceo and you have the forum you have the snow leopard secretary all these things which i spoke the next one uh, i i land with that um, and before i do that uh, so what do you really do where you have tigers in some countries you don't have them in a few so if you have them there is a portfolio you need to do you can't sit uh, take it i mean lie down and say everything is fine because it it's changing the dynamics are like that you know there's never a dull moment so you have a set of actions which you need to do uh, which is given on the left side i the, the fonts are very small 
you need to keep the protection, the refine it, and there's uh, always a chance for using technology and doing more than what is being done. And then um, and there are uh, other things of relating to sustainability, engagement, business models, so many refinements, uh, addressing uh, the villages, stepping into areas like climate smart villages, doing more for the villages so that the stewardship gets institutionalized and they start owning the agenda, so many things are there. And then certain countries on to your right, if you see revival is required actively, like um, say for example, Cambodia. They are very keen to revive and bring back the tigers actively. So if you want to do that actively, you need to actively revive some microcos, bring back the prey, prey animals, bring back the earlier linkages. If you have the forest, the investment may be less. If you don't have them, recall the pyramid, which we saw earlier. So you need to do more, so on and so forth. And then there are situations uh, where tigers are there, but density is less than some kind of a actions are called, but so many things are there. Then you, you have extremes like what you have in one very interesting place in India, in uh, uh, where Keshav is the advisor for that state, the Uttar Pradesh. You have you have this uh, tiger reserve, Pilibit. Now, the, the landscape around, you know, is so much anthropogenic that you have a lot of sugarcane cultivations. Now, you have more tigers outside than what you see in the source area, because cane my sugar canes, they are uh, sought after because they give you a lot of money. Local cultivators do that. Then they provide a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, shade, shelter, and people are there living close by to uh, tender them, nurture them, harvest them. Tigers also find it easy to thrive there because the wild pigs go and start uh, feeding there and uh, followed by the uh, gregarious group of deer, then the livestock, and then you have all kinds of uh, um, uh, situations, you know, their chance encounters, then then the habituation um, passing, uh, leading to some kind of a condition response subsequently, then the tigers um, bringing human beings in their uh, prey sp um, spectrum, so many things are there. That kind of adaption requires a different approach. Uh, Rewilding and taking them back, active management, rapid response teams to be in place, it's a very, very, very um, uh, difficult agenda where people uh, readily and rightfully so they turn they turn hostile to the entire tiger conservation and, uh, and there are instances where they set fire also uh, to for forest front lines with camps and 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 lot of issues are there. One there can never be a dull moment, a peaceful moment. One needs to be in a project mode in a crisis uh, containment mode in such areas. It's as good or as bad as disaster management, handling such areas where you have the interface in close proximity to the source area. Uh, well, um, and let's go to the last slide that is the consortium and the, yes, this is very important. Um, and I'll stop here. Uh, this is the, the Tiger United University Consortium, which has uh, given me this floor uh, uh, to speak. Uh, we have a wonderful collaboration, the GTF, uh, and um, a lot of things to uh, collaborate more and do more uh, uh, by engaging closely with the Tiger Range countries. Um, now, the collaboration uh, is important, and uh, I mean, you need lot of people because there are so many people working uh, in different areas, domain expertise, areas of interest differ. We, the resources are limited, so we can't afford at the juncture to waste them. So there should be no duplicity or duplicating, duplicating the same thing, you know. So you need to carefully map out who's doing what, where he's doing, which agency is doing what. Uh, we are at it. Uh, uh, and we are closely working with the consortium as far as the capacity building, exposing the officers uh, and the other interested groups uh, outside the government system. They'll be coming to India for their India, uh, their, their whatever schedule curriculum they have to, they need to complete uh, during the India stay. The forum um, through its ongoing um, projects and through its engagement with government of India and the states, 
um, we are engaging with several tiger states. So we'll try to facilitate their stay in India their, so that they can go back with uh, complete their work peacefully. Then um, some things which come to our mind, maybe it's not exhaustive and it, can, it will be more, definitely more. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, like this uh, close collaboration with the university consortium would be useful to us for citizen science, handling citizen science. Now, citizen science is needed for eliciting the much needed public support. Now, the public means you need, you need public which is educated in all South Asia, Southeast Asia. You have the village, uh, you have the small town, big towns, uh, they are uh, metropolitan cities and you have, I mean, centuries coexisting. In Delhi itself, we have a village, uh, Kotla village nearby, you have a five-star facility. So you can see a lot of things, you know, that's the beauty of these areas. You have um, some, uh, um, I mean, uh, some people say affluenza, very affluent uh, locales are there. And then people, uh, some portion may be just starving to earn their daily bread. I mean, anyway, it's not my mandate to speak on those things, but then uh, the citizens need to be involved. Uh, citizen science is important, whether you need to involve them, what an old man can do, what a young guy can do, what a school child, everyone is interested, whether you will come out with an, um, you know, digital, um, I mean, social media is the in thing these days and so many things with supercomputers, the consortium can do a lot and uh, e-learning portals are there, so many things are there. So citizen science in a big way, how to monitor, how to safeguard, what they can do, how to report a crime, so many things can be thought of on this. And um, there are experts who may guide us on this. And uh, that can be a good uh, research portfolio also. Then linking this agenda to ecosystem services, climate change and pandemic, we need to uh, sensitize people. Uh, I mean, there are uh, so many things being spoken about, so many conventions, so many signatories, so much is being done, you know, but then uh, this is the tiger agenda is uh, seen, that's what I feel, I may be wrong, I need to be wrong because some people feel there's something very exotic, it's not really relevant. Tiger is the basic, you know, it's an indicator, as I said. So we must drive home this linkage between all these things and then capacity building and other things, the front line, the boots on uh, the ground and so on, so, so forth. So many things are there. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, um, uh, I wanted to cover more, but then I need to give you time to interact and ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rashesh. That was uh, very informative and lots to lots to cover. Uh, we've learned a lot today. Uh, let me open up the floor for some questions. And uh, I'd like to take your questions. If not, we can also put some on the chat room. So uh, please let me open it up for questions. Well, I'm gonna read some of the questions. So the first is, could you please share your experience about the policy process and learned lessons from Indian tiger recovery program and how they can be helpful for other countries where tiger numbers are decreasing or have gone extinct? Okay, may I answer that? Mm, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. So see, this is the fundamental thing, a very good question, a very, uh, I mean, uh, valid thing, you know. Uh, we know something about uh, the biology, the ethology, the dynamics of the tiger and the counting process. So many peer-reviewed re reviewed publications are there, but nothing is going to uh, save the tigers unless the uh, countries own them up and the uh, uh, governance is um, energized and there's ownership because it's a, uh, uh, it's a sovereign issue, as I stated. So you need to have policy, you need to have a dedicated law, number one. You need to have a federal, in their federal setup or whatever setup these countries have, they need to have an overarching uh, setup which gives money. That's the main thing, you know. Not even, there are countries, I don't want to name them, not even symbolic allocation. They, they depend on collaborators for running the show. And that should not be the case. And you need a policy on deployment of frontline, the, right, the right age group, then building up their capacity and the normatives relating to protection, the use of technology. All these things are required. For this, you need policy, enabling policy regime, which is lacking in some of these countries. Some countries in South Asia, they have done pretty well. 
so uh, india did all that and the results are there nepal has done that bhutan has done that bangladesh is doing that um, but that needs to be done um, by other countries so the systems to cut the long story short uh, the enabling policy regime and then the funding support the uh, the and the uh, the planning the support for planning and the policy on involving the local people in stewardship all these things are important and above all the providing policy on providing inviolate space for tigers to think and the uh, transnationals with engagement between two countries which need to be there yeah that was it okay that was from pramod thank you for your question and the second question is from louise what can we do as people in the us to help wild tiger conservation efforts what are some action items that we can do Rachel, can you, sorry, repeat it? Yes, repeat can. What can we do as people in the United States to help the wild tiger conservation efforts? What are action items that we in the US can do? Oh, you can do a lot. Uh, especially those three things, you know, uh, um, the, the, uh, the role of tiger conservation, wild tiger conservation, uh, in securing adaptation toward the ill effects of climate change, and the role of wild tiger conservation in this part of the globe, uh, in these range countries, to secure the ecosystem services, and, and the role of the wild tiger conservation and the forests in which they are conserved, and in the dilution effects. I mean, this is going unnoticed. And above all, uh, um, I mean, since uh, 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 developed, uh, uh, the, the, you have the platform, you have you have the enabling regime out there in the US, you can help to drive home the point that uh, growing, developing at the cost of green capital, the natural capital is no development. Uh, so this change only US, uh, countries like US can uh, drive home, you know, uh, the GDP, the mad race uh, for GDP. I am not an economist, I can only uh, laugh at myself, but the way people, um, the macroeconomists, turn a blind eye towards um, um, this aspect, you know, growing at the cost of greens. What is that growth? It is a negative growth. You, you, we are ushering in the doomsday. Oh, US can address these things. If, if these are brought as centralized thematic areas in the climate dialogues, otherwise it's meaningless. Um, I mean, these should the centrality of these items should be there, and U.S. can do that. Okay, thank you. And a final question from Keshav. Um, informative presentation, Dr. Kapal. I was intrigued by the concept of co-occurrence instead of coexistence. Kindly elaborate, especially in the context of long-term mitigation of human-tiger conflicts. Well, uh, uh, human tiger conflict, uh, I mean, there can, uh, there, it, has, it needs to be managed actively. I mean, you can never say that it's, uh, it'll, there'll be no conflict because when you have these uh, varied demands on a landscape, like human beings having their demands and um, they are like, for example, there are tiger areas which touch uh, big towns, like you have Rajaji National Park touching and the Dehradun Township, so you're going to have all this. So you need the rapid response teams, you need uh, the, uh, the uh, rewilding centers, you need to deploy on a 24 into seven basis, the team, then the road hit should be prevented, the rail hit should be prevented, the garbage uh, which uh, is eaten by wild animals should be stopped. All this, the plethora of actions are there, which needs to be there in an ongoing manner. So, and the, the uh, animals in distress, animals causing distress, the agencies should be mandated and should be in readiness on a 24 into seven basis. There should be intelligent cameras monitoring these hotspots where possible um, you know, movements uh, uh, are happening and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rashesh. I think that's uh, all the time we have this morning, but we really appreciate all you've done and all you're doing globally to help protect this endangered species and our mascot of our four universities. Uh, let me also thank everyone for attending. Appreciate your support of this. I hope you'll continue to attend and join us on the road to Vladivostok. 
Our next seminar or webinar will be on July 29th, International Tiger Day, where we will be joined by uh, a noted scientist uh, emeritus from the Smithsonian Institute, Dr. Uh, John Seidensticker. Uh, and then we'll have a full array of uh, webinars throughout the fall. So with that, I'll close. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. And uh, we're, uh, we're adjourned. Everybody, please be safe and stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for active participation. It was a pleasure. Our pleasure, our honor. Thank you. Thank you.